Hello, everyone, and welcome to our virtual presentation of Naomi Hirahara's Clark and Division. Uh, we have signed copies available tonight. Uh, to purchase one, just click on the green purchase button. It will take you to our website where you can complete your purchase. Uh, just make sure to write signed copy in the order comments so that we can reserve a copy for you when you're checking out your card. Also, Naomi is generously uh, doing a raffle tonight. Uh, she is giving away a Nisei Chicago t-shirt, if she can show it to us. Yes. Um, so to enter the raffle, um, we are going to ask folks to ask a question for the audience Q&A. Uh, to submit a question, just use the ask a question feature at the bottom of the screen, and um, we will assign each person a number. And at the very end of the event, we'll randomly choose a number out of a hat and then we'll announce the winner. And if you've written a question in the chat, I'll also move it into the ask a question box. So don't worry. All right. So with that said, let me uh, properly introduce Naomi and then we can get started. So Naomi Hirahara is the Edgar Award winning author of the Masarai mystery series, including Summer of the Big Bocce, which was a publisher's weekly best book of the year and one of Chicago Tribune's 10 best mysteries and thrillers. She's also the author of the LA-based Ellie Rush mysteries. A former editor of the Rafu Shimpo newspaper, she has co-written nonfiction books like Life After Manzanar and the award-winning Terminal Island Lost Communities of Los Angeles Harbor. So I'm going to turn off my camera and uh, Naomi has a PowerPoint presentation uh, for us. So she's going to share her screen. Um, enjoy the talk, everyone. Hello, everyone. So nice to be here. Um, it's really great to be here at Romans. I mean, I'm actually a few blocks away, so I'm not lying when I'm in the general vicinity. So um, for today's um, inaugural book event, um, I don't have an interlocutor or someone to interview me. I will actually be sharing uh, a PowerPoint presentation and um, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Okay, so this is my beautiful cover of for Clark and Division and my editor, uh, Juliet Grams of um, Soho Crime is here in the house. So hello, Juliet. And it's just, I'm just thrilled. Um, this is kind of my hardcover debut. And Soho has just done a beautiful job in terms of just the whole presentation of the book, the editing, the publicity. So I really thank them. So I'm going to start off, probably most of you know that this book is based in Chicago. Most of it's in Chicago, but it starts off in Los Angeles. And since I'm sitting here in LA, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, the beginning, which is set in a place called Tropical, which um, is present day Atwater on, along the border of Glendale and Los Angeles. And I wanted to read a section of chapter one to you. Rose was always there, even while I was being born. It was a breech birth. The midwife, soaked in her own sweat, as well as some of my mother's, had been struggling for hours and didn't notice my three-year-old sister inching her way to the stained bed. According to the midwife, mom was screaming unrepeatable things in Japanese when Rose, the first one to see an actual body part of mine, yanked my slimy foot good and hard. Ito-san! The midwife's voice cut through the chaos, and my father came in to get Rose out of the room. Rose ran. Pop couldn't catch her at first, and when he finally did, he couldn't control her. In a matter of minutes, Rose, undeterred by the blood on my squirming body, returned to embrace me into her fan club. Until the end of her days, and even beyond, my gaze would remain on her. Our first encounter became Ito family lore, how I came into the world in our town of Tropical, a name that hardly anyone in Los Angeles knows today. For a while, I couldn't remember a time when I was apart from Rose. We slept curled up like pill bugs on the same thin mattress. It was pachanko, flat as a pancake, but we didn't mind. Our spines were limber back then. We could have slept on a blanket over our dirt yard, which we sometimes 
which we did sometimes during those hot Southern California Indian summers, our puppy rusty at our bare feet. Tropical was where my father and other Japanese men first came to till the rich alluvial soil for strawberry plants. They were the Issei, the first generation, the pioneers who were the progenitors of us, the Nisei. Pop had been fairly successful until the housing subdivisions came. The other Issei farmers fled south to Gardena or north to San Fernando Valley, but Pop stayed and got a job at one of the produce markets clustered in downtown Los Angeles, only a few miles away. Tonai sold every kind of vegetable and fruit imaginable. Pascal celery from Venice, iceberg lettuce from Santa Maria and Guadalupe, Larson strawberries from Gardena, and Hale's best cantaloupes from Imperial Valley. My mother had immigrated from Kagoshima in 1919 when she was in her late teens to marry my father. The two families had known each other way back when, and while my mother wasn't officially a picture bride, she was mighty close. My father, who had received mom's photograph from his own mother, liked her face, her strong and broad jaw, which suggested she might be able to survive the frontier of California. His hunch was right. In so many ways, she was even tougher than my father. When I was five, Pop was promoted to market manager and we moved to a larger house, still in Tropical. The house was close to the red car electric streetcar station, so Pop didn't need to drive into work, but he usually traveled in his Model A anyway. He wasn't the type to wait around for a train. Rose and I still shared a room, but we had our own beds, although during certain nights when the Santa Ana wind blew through our loose window frames, I would end up crawling in beside her. Aki, she called cry out as my cold toes brushed against her calves. She'd turn and fall back asleep while I trembled in her bed, fearful of the mood moving shadows of the sycamore trees, demented witches in the moonlight. So that is the first, um, the start of Clark and Division. So how did I come to write a book that follows a family from Los Angeles to Manzanar to Chicago. And um, some of you are familiar with this nonfiction book that I co-wrote with my friend, um, Heather Lindquist, um, called Life After Manzanar. And it was, you know, I, I was familiar with the, um, the journey of uh, Japanese Americans to Chicago. A lot of my friends, older friends or friends a little older, uh, about my age had been born in Chicago. So I knew that something of our history had taken us there. But it wasn't until this book that I realized that um, this had been the number one destination for Japanese Americans from the 10 um, uh, incarceration camps throughout the US. And the reasons for this was, you know, we're, uh, back then Chicago was the number two city in the you know, largest city in the US. Um, it was in the middle of the country. There was defense industry and factories that needed laborers. So that's why the government, as well as um, organizations like the American Friends Service, decided to encourage or push Japanese Americans to relocate um, to there from camp. And this started as early as 1943. So, um, and then in doing this book, um, I learned about these young people, you know, the average age of Japanese Americans going there were in their mid twenties. They were without their immigrant parents. They didn't have parental supervision. And as a result, um, there was some uh, delinquencies. There was uh, babies being born out of wedlock. There were abortions, which were illegal at the time. There was a stick up man. There was of course gambling. And um, there was a sexual maniac who was terrorizing um, Nisei women. So as a, a mystery writer, I found this all fascinating because I had never really heard of it. And so this is where fiction plays a role because we, we don't have those exact stories of what happened. So I guess for me, I feel like 
doing as much research as I can and understanding people's sensibility to kind of fill in the gaps. And that's what um, Clark and Division seeks to do. Um, what's been helpful are photographs, like this is from Janice D. Tanaka, and these are some of her family members. And back then, um, there were, these came from Los Angeles, these young men, they were wearing zoot suits, and suddenly they're walking the streets of Chicago. And um, people are like wondering, you know, and there were about 400 Japanese Americans who had lived in Chicago before World War II. And by the mid forties, there were 20,000. So I think for the people who had lived in Chicago before World War II, they're kind of wondering who are these people? <laughs> um, of course, this is the photo that was used in the LA Times um, story that um, it came out in their digital edition today. But it, this is one of the few, I think, governmental war relocation authority photographs that really captures kind of the, the surprise, the anguish, um, just the, the uh, ca future chaos that these um, Japanese Americans would face as they move into a new city. Um, so, I knew I, I had was looking at an old um, journal, and I think around December of 2016, I want I knew I wanted to write something about um, Chicago, a novel set in Chicago, but I wasn't quite sure of the storyline. But it did help that like ten months later, um, I contacted a friend, Eric Matsunaga, who had uh, he's from Chicago but had lived in LA and is a writer himself and a social historian of his beloved town, Chicago. And he was nice enough to take me on a walking tour of this one area called Clark and Division. Clark and Division is actual intersection um, in Chicago and it's one of uh, the early um, locations um, where Japanese Americans settled after camp. And later they moved out into Lakeview, the, the other areas of Chicago, and they, some people, um, they uh, established roots in those neighborhoods. But Clark and Division was definitely a transitory type neighborhood. And um, so that's why I felt being a person from Los Angeles who hasn't spent that much in Chicago, I felt more comfortable. Um, capturing this one neighborhood that no longer exists, that nobody really knows much about. And there's a lot of wonderful like oral histories that are with the Japanese American National Museum and as well as books, kind of people talking a little bit about um, the, uh, the transitory, um, the challenges that people had faced um, during World War II. Um, I'm standing in front of um, a former boarding house. Actually, it's a very beautiful exterior. And um, um, Eric had done a, like a Google map that showed all the different um, businesses had, and boarding houses that were in the area. And if you want to read more about his work, you could go to his Instagram, Windy City Nikkei, or on Discover Nikkei. He has um, an essay on Clark and Division. Um, so there's not much left um, in the city uh, of this community. Um, they were, it, the government was telling Japanese Americans, they were discouraging them from um, creating any kind of permanent Japan towns. And I think, so that's one reason why um, even Chicagoans are not aware of this history. Um, this is the Mark Twain Hotel that's still in existence. Um, and there was a famous um, hairdresser, um, beauty salon uh, owned by, operated by Nisei in the hotel. So that's one thing I have included in the book. It's not, it's inspired by the, the particular real beauty salon. Um, this photo, and many of you in the Japanese American community will know, this is Soup 
Kunitomi Embry, and she's an a activist. She was an activist and educator, and she was a person who really fought for Manzanar to be a national historic site. And this is, and she actually worked at the Newberry while she was in Chicago. So when Eric and I were walking Clark and Division, I go, "Oh, the Newberry's nearby." So we walked there, and I was just astounded at how beautiful it was. And I was just um, trying to reconcile my mind, like Sue had gone from, um, you know, the deserts of of Manzanar to this beautiful area. And and that's was kind of a seed of you know maybe I wanted to make my protagonist who became a, a Aki Ito and have her also work at the Newberry so that has become part of this novel as well. Um, there are a few vestiges of uh, Japanese American history and. Um, for instance, there's this okay Hamburger King. You know, I don't live in Chicago, so it doesn't mean that much to me. But for those of you who have, it, it may be, and it's now known as Rice and Bread. It's on Sheffield, so not far from um, uh, Wrigley Stadium, baseball stadium. And there's um, this food is called the Octagawa, and it's named after a, a, a person, George Akutagawa, who kept ordering this kind of combination of ground hamburger, eggs, green peppers, onions, and bean sprouts. So the, uh, this rice and bread still serves it. And apparently there's another location that serves this type of food. It's kind of like chop suey, but they call it the Oktagawa. But anyway, um, and there's also a Nisei Lounge, and that's connected to our giveaway. Um, this this bar no longer has any direct um, connection to Japanese Americans, but they've kept the name and um, kind of they they have spread the history. It, it originates from uh, a Nisei-owned um, bar or maybe a liquor store around Clark and Division like in the late 40s and then before it eventually moved to this location, um, its current like location on Sheffield. So ask questions um, if you want to be considered for this giveaway for the store prize. Um, I also did a visit to Chicago um, a year later and my guide here was uh, Bob Kumaki. Um, he and his wife Mary Collins were so um, so kind to show me um, around. Uh, we went to his temple the Buddhist Temple of Chicago, and I did a presentation there. And one thing that was really amazing was in this one room was this altar that had been created at a camp, Heart Mountain. And um, it was for a, a church that Reverend Gome and Mini Kubosa, uh, well, Reverend Gome had led, uh, Kubosa had led. And so he came from Heart Mountain to Chicago in 1944. There was another temple as well. And um, what I thought was really cool um, was they do have an honorary sign, um, just um, honoring the, the, the couple, so which I thought was nice. Um, another place Bob took me was um, Montrose Cemetery. This is kind of in the north part of Chicago. It was started by a German-born man. And um, they weren't allowing, at one point, they weren't allowing Japanese uh, Americans um, to be buried in other cemeteries. But this particular cemetery was open. And uh, before World War II, they actually uh, started this mausoleum. So they would put ashes of like um, Japanese bachelors who um, were indigent, they were too poor to um, afford any kind of plot. So they would just store their ashes in there. So I found it really moving. And this is one of, again, just one of the few things that have been left behind of uh, the long Japanese American presence in Chicago. So of course, I also, the Montrose Cemetery is also in the book as well. And um, it is very important. Um, it's, um, so 
Um, that's a little about, bit about the history. Um, but I, you know, when you're writing historical, it can't be just about history. You have to have another narrative. You have to have a separate narrative that talks about the characters. So I was um, trying, you know, thinking of various different combinations of various plot lines. I am a mystery writer, so I did want to have uh, a mysterious angle to this, a, a crime, which was very apt. It was appropriate. And I think when there's a crime, it forces certain issues to the forefront. So I think in terms of my family, the Ito family um, and my protagonist, Aki, that they really had to wrestle with um, uh, the racism and, and the legacy of the camp um, because of this crime that um, befalls their family. So um, I, I wanted to write this um, book from a Nisei woman's point of view. I had been struggling to do this for years. I had done a short story called The Chidashi Covenant, Megan Abbott, and her book actually comes out today too. So happy book birthday to Megan. Um, she had asked for um, short stories. It's called Hell of a Woman. So I wrote this short story. It's set in the 1950s with a Nisei woman. Um, they're all former Nisei uh, queen, beauty queens. But um, it ends up she gets involved, you know, in an extra marital affair with a white man and someone's body is cut up and placed in a suitcase. So it, it was very noir and some people like that, but it really wasn't representative of, I think, the optimism that I, I and strength of Nisei women. So I, I've been trying to, you know, I wanted to write more like a, a, a reflect kind of the life of a, an attitude of a typical Nisei woman. And I just figured I came across, I, I was kind of fascinated by sisters. And what's strange is I don't have a sister myself. So a lot of, all of Clark and Division is from my head and just things that are imagined and things that I have observed. So um, I've used this for writing workshops. So um, I did have challenges in, in, in um, forming the story. And I know Juliet, my editor is in, in the audience, so she could attest to this. Um, I had to go, you know, after I finished my first draft, um, I had, I didn't have my lead character, Aki Ito, I didn't have her personality or um, it, a lot of times people say, you know, show, don't tell. But if you're writing a first person book, you have to tell. And I think I was um, holding back um, a little bit about her voice. And some of it was probably my own personality. Um, and in some ways, you know, I'm a Nisei too, because my mother is from Japan. Um, Nisei is second generation Japanese American. So it, in some ways, um, I kind of understood um, Aki's position in terms of being a protector of her parents. Um, I think we shared we share um, those kind of similarities. So anyway, I call this a cigar box because when I was a kid, I just thought it was so cool, you know, um, to put your treasures in a cigar box. And so, when I was doing my rewrites, I had to kind of dip in, go deep and pick out these elements in my cigar box, or in some cases I needed to let go of them. So I wanted to show a few examples and then we'll go to the questions. So, um, Juliet, this is what you, you know, I, I did I, that in the earlier drafts, there was almost, I had almost never let us into her psychology. So the draft did not go deep into um, Aki's, where she was emotionally. So I just learned that this X is, I had to excise my own cultural blocks and um, actually um, articulate, you know, what was going on with her. So this is um, 
uh, one thing that was added. I looked down at my hands in my lap. I never considered saying how I felt about things. How could I when I was when I always seemed to be grasping in the darkness to understand where I stood. So, um, so there were th additions like this that it may seem that um, Aki, you know, wasn't doing anything at times or wasn't reacting in ways that people would e expect her to. But these were kind of the things internally that was going on with her. Um, this is supposed to be an hourglass, but I also had to think about my own experience. And then, um, Juliet, you said, give us a lot more insight into Aki's thoughts and feelings. So this is something um, I, I think many of us who are people of color, there's times where we don't like someone might say something rude and we don't say anything in return. And um, so this is from. Aki's point of view. By this time, we understood how the world worked for us. To articulate the attitudes against us would give them power and credence. We preferred to release the pain silently, let it rise in invisible balloons that we couldn't see, but we could feel, bumping against our foreheads and shoulders, warning us not to stray too far from what was expected. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of a couple of examples. And luckily, Julie let, uh, liked what I did at the end. She wrote, engrossing, exciting to watch. So that was good. So for your for the writers in the audience, this is kind of the things I had to do to dig deeper. I actually interviewed people. I interviewed like younger sisters because this is a story of an older sister, Rose, that goes to Chicago and something tragic happens. And it's up to Aki, the younger sister, to find out the truth as well as to support her, her parents um, through this chaotic time period. Um, I had to mine my own vulnerable moments. And then, um, yeah, Juliet had mentioned something about um, the great Gatsby, you know, and, and Nick Carraway's um, narration um, because he he's writing about Gatsby and how he's um, enamored with him, right? So I I have Aki who's enamored um, with her sister. So um, so actually, one of my friends from Stanford had written a book about Great Gatsby. So I just got her in a phone on the phone and we talked about it. So I have no idea how much that really helped shape my narrative nar narrative, but who knows, you know? And then. Lastly, be aware of your emotional and cultural blocks. So what's next? Um, in the short term, this on August 6th, the uh, Japanese version of Hiroshima Boy is coming out. So I'm really um, curious to see um, how what the Japanese uh, think about the book. Um, and then I've been writing a lot of short stories. So um, I'm in this collection, The Silver Ways of Summer. It's like noir short stories um, at the surf noir. <laughs> and I, I don't have a surfer, but I have a Japanese American family at the beach, at Huntington Beach in the 1980s. And I know uh, Huntington Beach has been in the news lately, but the Huntington Beach I know, I know from the 80s was very different. And then I turned the second Leilani Santiago book. It will be coming out next year. And it's um, set in the middle of the pandemic. So um, that was interesting to write. So yeah, so those are some of the things. Oh, and then um, speaking of short stories, um, uh, a short story I wrote, The Celestial, which is also a historical set in um, the end of the 1800s has been optioned by friends, filmmakers. So this will be an independent film. Um, you know, it'll be a labor of love. So, but it's in good hands with Pablo Morales as well as Pam Tom, who's an award-winning documentary filmmaker. So I'm excited to see what happens. Oh, and then um, in, there will be a follow-up to Clark and Division, and it's going to be called Evergreen. And I think this image will, um, this was taken by um, a 
woman um, who lived in New York, Marianne Palfi, a photographer. And compared to those pristine, you know, uh, war relocation authority photos, this kind of sh really shows like how chaotic things were. Um, four families in one room. This is 1946 in Los Angeles. And this was a hostel in Boyle Heights. So this is going to be kind of um, my image that I hold as I start to work on Evergreen, which I will be doing immediately. <laughs> so anyway, question. So this is the really a uh, nice t-shirt, which is, I think, the predecessor for um, the Nisei Lounge, Nisei Liquor Store. So this is what we're going to give away to one lucky person who asks a question. So, yeah. So that is, um, oh, I, I didn't get us to see all your comments. So thank you very much. Um, so Rira, oh, we have 20 questions. Yes. All right. So I know some people submitted more than one question, but uh, the way we're doing with the raffle numbers is each person gets a, okay. a, a number. So it's not okay. like if you have uh, multiple okay. questions, you get it. Okay. All right. And if you um, want to submit your question now, you can. We'll, um, I'll, I'll keep track of the numbers. Okay, great. Okay. And some of these questions were answered during the presentation, but feel free to expand on them, uh, Naomi. All okay. right. Okay. So this question is from Sherry. Did you discover any surprises researching the Japanese American community in Chicago? What things were the same and different from the community in LA? Mm, that's a really good question, Sherry. Um, I, I think, I, you know, it was something that I definitely knew that there wasn't a, uh, uh, any kind of official Japantown in Chicago, but I think it did surprise me that there were so many people here, and yet that kind of that com community has been erased. And I even saw with the Mark Twain Hotel um, online, you could see they 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 actually also applied for a national historic um, designation. Um, and then I was reading the document, and there was nothing about the fact that there had been so many Japanese who had lived there at one time. So I think the erasure was um, sad to me. Um, you know, I'm used to going to places like, you know, the Pacific Northwest and San Francisco and even LA, and we have stanchions, you know, kind of talking about the history and that it, does, it the same thing is not, is not being done in Chicago a place that really celebrates ethnicity, right? The, the Polish and the Greeks and, you know, all of that you, you see physically like their churches and things like that. And that the um, Japanese American experience is, it doesn't have um, a landmark. Um, they, I mean, they do have the Japanese American Service and, uh, Committee um, facility, which is really great. Um, but yeah, I think that that to me is is kind of unfortunate. Um, but, and speaking of the Japanese American Service Committee, they um, they have a great um, photographic archive. And there, this is a little bit later than my story, but they show like these young people like playing um, these games. Like I, I don't know what they had some kind of candy that they were um, had on toothpicks, and they were like men and uh, young men and women were kind of passing it along. And um, it, it's kind of, I don't, I wouldn't say sexy, but it was, you know, it, it wasn't your um, obvious, I mean, your traditional like staid kind of Nisei photo interaction. So I think the, the liberation and the, the party aspect of it, uh, of living in Chicago as a young person, um, it seemed, uh, it, that it could be very fun at times. So that was interesting. Uh, speaking of young people, this question is from Mike. How is the younger Japanese American generation, um, how are they becoming familiar with Clark and Division history, especially since there are no remnant sites? 
uh, their parents' and grandparents' histories are there. Well, um, and and Mike, I know this guy who's the head of the <laughs> Little Tokyo <laughs> um, Historical Society, and he has a lot of um, he has a lot of relatives in Chicago, and I think there um, there's some filmmakers. Um, like Jason Matsumoto, and there's other folks who are um, busy um, documenting this history. Um, when I was there, let me see, I don't know if it was in, I guess it was 2018, there, they, there was an exhibit there that had been traveling, and it has images that I think we on the West Coast have seen, like Dorothea Lange's photos of Manzanar and Ansel Adams. But it was interesting for me to attend that exhibition in Chicago and just to see the uh, attendees. And they were kind of shocked and surprised. So I was thinking, oh, this is an audience that's kind of unfamiliar with the story even though it really directly touches Chicago. So I think from there, there's storytellers, there's a lot of, I, you know, there's people who are third generation or fourth generation. There might be, you know, as young as 20, in their 20s or 30s themselves. And so it's like their grandparents' stories. So they're um, seeking new ways to kind of tell the story. I'm an old person, I'm old school. I, you know, a lot of like Sue Kunitomi Embry was a friend um, and a lot of these other people, like I worked at the Japanese American newspaper and there were a lot of people like William Horry who had um, come from Chicago that I knew. So I see myself as uh, writing more of a traditional historical where I'm I really trying to as much as possible, um, get a lot of those details correct, um, as historically accurate as possible. And then others in the future, they can riff off of it and do new things with it. But I think we're kind of missing um, the portion that really digs in what really happened. Okay, next question is from Rachel. In your view, how do Chicago Nikkei dif differ from SoCal Japanese Americans, or do they differ? I think um, the ones, well, I, I think what's interesting when you uh, read the accounts of folks that were from Chicago, you know, originally, and then they're kind of watching the, the West Coast folks come in and they, was thinking they're kind of uncouth. <laughs> there were uncouth, um, you know, there, there were a lot more of more Japanese Americans from the West Coast. So th I think there was more of a, a diversity of experience, maybe a diversity of, um, there might've been very working class folks, you know, to the whole array. So I think, um, you know, just uh, for LA people, growing up in an ethnic community, it, it's very different from people that are more in white spaces. And um, that may kind of dictate or limit the way they can express themselves. Um, another thing that um, I found interesting was, you know, in Chicago, you could intermarriage with a, a Japanese American can marry a white person, right? And that was illegal in, in California at the time. So this is what I found so interesting is that we in California, we view ourselves as being very liberal and open and all this. But, you know, when it when it comes to those, you know, intermarriage um, um, and just plain out racism, probably because there was so many of us on the West Coast, we controlled agriculture, you know, so uh, the fishing industry. So. Um, the powers that be, you know, uh, viewed Japanese Americans as being more of a threat. So I think um, there was more overt racism. Well, definitely, right? Because people were forced, to, you know, uh, from their homes and removed. So I think that kind of experience from the West Coasters, that's going to be very different from someone who didn't have to, you know, they didn't lose their job. 
they didn't have to move. So there's that contrast. Okay, so next question is from Jennifer. How did you choose the names of the sisters, Aki and Rose, and the symbolism of nature surrounding their names? Um, you know, I so a lot of people have asked me about Rose because um, actually one academic, one professor, she assumed that I was um, making a reference to Tokyo Rose. Um, and actually, uh, uh, there's connections to the person who was called Tokyo Rose to Chicago, but I'm from Pasadena <laughs> and um, you know, it's like the Rose queen, the Rose, you know, all that. So I had an affinity for that name. I, I like, there's some uh, roses in my life that I really have adored. So it, um, and so it, that's another reason why I wanted to name the older, because I had so much esteem and respect for these roses. So I wanted to put, um, yeah, uh, salute them, honor them. And with Aki, you know, I played around with Dot, like Dorothy, you know, and it just came to be that I, I figured, you know what, she needs to have a Japanese name. Um, and, but I like to have short ones because some people have problems with long Japanese names. And um, I, I just, you know, it's very personal. I, there's some Akis in my life that I really like. So that's one reason why I chose Aki. But you're right. They're both uh, referred to nature. Um, I, I thought also, too, that, um, I, you know, Aki thinks that she's an ordinary person, but she's an outlier. And just the fact that she has a Japanese name, I think, in contrast to other people in her life who have more, you know, European names, I think uh, signifies something. All right. Uh, this question is from Victor. Actually, Victor asked uh, a bunch of questions, but um, since you answered some of them, I'm going to pick one that uh, wasn't answered. Did you find examples of Japanese Americans and Asian Americans in Chicago interacting with Japanese Americans in Detroit, Minneapolis, and Cleveland? Um, can you repeat that question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Did you did you find examples of Japanese Americans and Asian Americans in Chicago interacting with Japanese oh. Americans in Detroit, Minneapolis, and Cleveland? Sure. I mean, there's so much diaspora. You know. Um, just there, people moved from place to place. Um, and in fact, even one of my characters in Clark and Division moves from Chicago to Detroit. So you mentioned a lot of places, um, Victor, where, you know, Japanese, I, I think among the places Japanese Americans went to, including Chicago was Denver um, and Detroit, you know, um, for, uh, to work in factories. So any, any, and, and there's other folks that worked in, on farms. So there's so many, and then there's Seabrook in New Jersey. So the diaspora story is fascinating. Um, the different parts of the U.S. that um, these group of individuals were sent. Most of them, however, returned to California, but not all. So um, it's interesting to hear the stories of the people who remained in their locations. Uh, that's interesting because another question that Mike had asked was, do you know the percentage of Japanese Americans who left Chicago and then resettled back on the West Coast? Uh, I can't remember the name, uh, the number, but it was pretty significant. I think it was, you know, maybe 80%. Um, that's, that's pretty high. Yeah, it was very high. And, you know, it makes sense. I mean, even though there wasn't the overt racism in Chicago as there was, you know, in in California, that's where they were from, you know. Um, of course, there was the weather. <laughs> uh, the, the winters are so brutal. But um, I think, you know, there are some people who had, uh, um, they had neighbors that, had been, you know, not everyone had a horrific experience with their neighbors, you know, some uh, advocated for them or held their 
items in storage. Um, so, and you know, who can beat California, right? <laughs> and I think there's just something about the ocean, Pacific Ocean. I mean, this is pure conjecture on my part, but I know for me, and I think what I was imagining with Aki was there's something about um, the ground, the earth that you grew up, you know, she was born, like I read, she was born in tropical. So there's something about the place where you were born that kind of calls you back. So I, I think, again, conjecture that this might have been true for the people who had lived in Chicago. Um, this question is from Susie. Were families able to refuse relocation to Chicago? So I'm oh, guessing oh, yeah. they're asking if they could have moved to a different city. Sure, sure. It was just voluntary. Um, but they were really uh, pushing it. They were like black and white, you know, um, reels that they were showing, um, of, you know, the, the great Chicago, you know. So and there were a lot of jobs, you know. So, I mean, that's what people need. They needed to work. So I think that was another thing that probably attracted to them, but they could, you know, people were going all over the place, it, it, but they needed permission. And that's why um, it was mostly Nisei, American born Japanese Americans who were the first to go. And there was also a lot of um, colleges, you know, people, Nisei went for college in different locations as well. Um, and that's why um, towards the end of like, camp like a camp like Manzanar the people who are left in camp and some of them stayed until after the war 19 the end of you know 1945 um, were older people um, you know immigrants or there were very young people you know people with young children because they didn't have a lot of options okay so uh, this question is from Susan I'm lucky enough to have read the advanced copy, so I know how it ends. Without giving away the ending, did you start out knowing how the story would end, or did that evolve as you were writing? Um, it evolved. It evolved, for sure. I knew general, general things, uh, but I had questions. <laughs> I had questions myself, but as... Um, the mis as I kept writing, it became more apparent what had happened. So, um, and that's usually what happens with my mysteries. I have an idea, I'm not totally sure. And then, you know, as you dig into your characters, it becomes uh, clearer. Um, but with Clark and Division, I really wanted to be more of an organic mystery. She's not I mean, she's investigates, but she's not, she's no Nancy Drew and she has other things on her plate as well. So. Um, give me one second. We, we got like new questions in, mm -hmm. <laughs> in the field. So um, I think this is a related question uh, from Nancy. Did you get a feeling that people who left the camp to live in Chicago were treated well or poorly by the local Japanese or Japanese American community since they were not incarcerated? I, I think some people were very helpful. Um, and I think some were maybe, I mean, I think in terms of the Japanese Americans, they felt who are troublemakers, um, there was probably resentment, like why don't they behave? You know, they're, they're not being uh, good representatives, you know, of the Japanese American community, you know, there, I think there was kind of um, both those kind of feelings. Okay, um, I saw I saw a good question earlier. Hold on. Uh, this one is from Peter. I realize the time frames may not overlap. But have you considered doing a crossover where a character from one of your series meets a character <laughs> from a different series? Do you have your own universe, uh, Naomi? I, I definitely have my own universe. Maybe with the follow-up book, Evergreen, um, something can happen. Um, but generally, all my characters are in the same universe. Um, there's Easter eggs, <laughs> um, for instance, in my 
um, middle grade book, A Thousand One Cranes, Haruo, um, Masarai's best friend, appears only in name. Um, in the Ellie Rush book, uh, the second one, Masarai shows up. Um, so there's a little bit of that. Oh, and then Ellie Rush is related to Leilani Santiago. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, you could be only super astute or just a plain weird nerd <laughs> to, to kind of follow all those connections, but there are connected. I, yeah, I should probably with this follow up, with the follow up evergreen, I should, I will try to insert something. <laughs> okay, uh, this will be the last question and then we'll yeah. do the uh, drawing. So this question is from Erica. Did any of your characters surprise you along the way? Mm. Yeah, um, I have a, a zoot suitor hammer, Ishimine, and he, he surprised me. I'm still trying to figure him out. And so we'll see more in um, what happens in Evergreen because I, he's going to appear there. So, yeah. Okay. Well, let me let me see how many numbers we have. Uh, I think we had 23. Okay. Yes, 23 total. So I pre-cut these things. 23, you said? Okay. Yes, 23. Okay, okay. So how are we going to handle this again, Mira? Are, are we gonna... Okay, yeah, well, um, draw out the number. And uh, once we announce the winner, I should have your email address because um, in order to register this event, um, you should have. Um, okay, so the winner is number five. So let me see. Okay, so number five is Suzette, Mans uh, Su Suzette Mason. So congratulations, uh, right. Suzette. Um, so we, so I will contact you by email and let you know that you're the winner, and I will connect you to Naomi so that uh, she can send you that wonderful shirt. All right. Well, that should do it. Hold on. Let me put myself back on half screen right here. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you, Naomi, for that wonderful PowerPoint presentation. Thank you for everyone who sent in such insightful questions. Also, the chat was great, too. I learned so much. Um, I know we have a couple of uh, Chicago Nisei in this chat, so it was great hearing everyone's thoughts. Um, again, we have signed copies of Clark and Division available. Naomi actually stopped by the other day to sign a bunch of copies. Uh, so to get one, uh, just make sure to write signed copy in the order comments when you are checking out your cart on our website. And uh, for those of you who tuned in late, don't worry, you can rewatch the talk uh, very shortly. The replay should be available uh, under the same link. But um, other than that, yeah, Naomi, do you have any last words? I miss all of you in person, but, you know, um, at least we can do this. And it, yes, it's least. great. I'll, I'll go back later and I, I'll, I'll slowly read all the comments. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, have a good night, everyone, and stay safe. All right. Bye-bye, everyone.